Welcome to Ego Radio. We get you in the minds of creatives and entrepreneurs who are breaking ground. It's easy to make a hit, but it's hard to build a career. How do you stay fresh and curious with your art, work, and life? That's what we're here to find out. This week, you'll be tuning into a conversation with Eric Durst, a VFX supervisor based out of LA whose work spans all the way from the original Tron in 1982 to Spider-Man 2 and more recently, Bon Joon-ho's Snowpiercer. He's been in the industry for 40 years, he's a veteran, and we basically covered his whole life story. How he broke into the industry, what it takes to make a great feature film, and towards the end, what Bon Joon-ho is like as a director. We actually met by complete chance. I just bumped into Eric at a coffee shop on Young Street, and he was generous enough to give me the time of day. (laughs) He's a real sweetheart, and with that, let's get into it. My name is Ethan Cabral. I'm a filmmaker based out of Toronto, and this is Ego Radio. Normally, I'd leave it there, but um, this is this is a long one, so buckle up. Feel free to go grab a snack. You know, go do your thing. Come back later. But yeah, um, enjoy. This was this is a great episode. I learned a lot, and I hope uh, I hope if you're an artist, if you're someone who's trying to do something significant with their life, that you can take away a little uh, one-two lessons from this. You know. I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of like from you growing up to sure. like now what yeah. your journey, not just like through VFX was, but kind of your interest in art in general. Right. Well, it started, I grew up in Arkansas, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and uh, my dad was a, was a painter and a art professor and he built or had, uh, was hired to build an art center at the University of Arkansas, which is really the first art center in America, meaning what I mean by that is a building that housed all the arts. And uh, so in this building, there was uh, music, dance, theater, uh, sculpture, painting, you know, everything was in one place. Because the idea is that uh, all the arts are interrelated. So you, if you're going to uh, be a dancer and you're not around a music school, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, those are all tied together, just as painting is just like with sculpture and theater and, you know, all these things go together. So yeah, I grew yeah. up in that kind of environment and it was a very fortunate kind of upbringing because I was able to sort of be there all throughout my childhood and and would be in plays at at the university level when I was like, you know, 10. And so you got to do some really fantastic things. And I always knew I wanted to be an artist. And uh, let me talk about the art center just a minute, minute because um, it was built on the Bauhaus, which is a school in Germany, which has sort of had the same philosophy of that, like all the, all the... You're saying the way that all the different disciplines of art were combined together in the same building, kind right. of, it was built on the principles uh, that were there in Bauhaus with right. uh, combining all the arts in, in one building. And... Exactly. And it's like gotcha. when you're having a casual conversation in the hallway or you bump into people and get to be friends you know, someone else is a, a sculptor and you are an architect or you're something like that. And, and then you just, it, it, it's really part of the education, actually probably the most important part of the education is that those kind of relationships. So um, that's sort of how I grew up. And then um, I went to architecture school at the University of Arkansas for a couple of years, fantastic, amazing architecture department. And then, uh, I decided really I didn't want to be an architect necessarily. I like the, the theory of being an architect, but so much of architecture is just the, the regulations and building and there are the mechanics of it that, that sort of go outside the creative part. So I wanted to look from other uh, areas. And um, at that point, I discovered CalArts and CalArts is here in Valencia, California, in Los Angeles. And it was founded by Walt Disney. Uh, and although it was very opposite of Walt Disney uh, when it when it started, and it was a pretty uh, pretty crazy little place. Um, but it had it was a, a why school. um why do you say that? why do you say it was the opposite of Walt Disney? 
Well, I, I don't really have context for it. What was Walt Disney? Sure. Walt like Disney was to... was pretty conservative. And let's say in animation, I ended up in animation. I started in photography, but very quickly ended up in animation. And CalArts has the greatest animation department in the world. And that's where the, like the, the guys who started Pixar uh, went to school there, uh, you know, et cetera. I mean, it's a lot of fantastic work that was done there. And I went there when it was, wasn't was quite as, as um, uh, world-renowned as it is now, established, yeah. Now, uh, and so I was fortunate to sort of uh, get myself in there, not having ever done uh, animation, but uh, went there. And um, let's see. So um, what was your question again? You, you were asking about... Just just kind of like, uh, what, like what was your, your journey in terms of... Uh, yeah, your curiosity and, and fascination into the world of art. Yeah, well, it it um, anyway. I ended up, you know, I ended up at Cal Arts just because it uh -huh. was very much an offshoot of what I had in Arkansas, and yeah, it yeah. was uh, a situation where you had many, you know, disciplines next to each other and things like that. Now, I always knew I wanted to be in art. Uh, just because that was my upbringing, but I didn't, it was confusing in a way because I didn't really know which one to go into. And when I went to CalArts, the, the beauty about that is I got into um, animation because, and filmmaking, because that was really uh, a combination of everything. I mean, you can be involved in, in uh, theater, of course, and cinematography, photography, and you can get involved in architecture, which is really production design and building of sets and things like that. So, and every, everything combined together, it just seemed like a natural fit. And so I did uh, animated films um, for uh, quite a while and was an independent animator. I, oh, the, the, the question you were asking about Walt Disney, the context of Walt Disney. And uh, Disney was, who, whose money founded CalArts, uh, was pretty conservative. And in animation, uh, you can think of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Disney films, which are realistic in a, in a way. I mean, they're very stylistic, but they're very realistic and uh, rooted in reality. Uh -huh. And Jules Engel, who was the, the uh, teacher and a mentor to many, many great um, filmmakers um, uh, ran the department, but he was more an abstract filmmaker and everything was abstract and it was counter to Disney. And it was very much like if you were doing figurative animation, that was poo poo, you know, that was not considered <laughs> really purist enough. And so you had to be an, uh, an abstract kind of um, uh, image maker. And in a way, what I learned, because I was sort of a hybrid of that, is that everything is abstract in a way. I mean, everything is just marks on a page. So yeah. it's like uh, those marks happen to form an image in your mind that reminds you of a face, or those images, marks on a page happen to remind you just of, a, of an, ener an energy of some kind. So it's like it's all related, but um, it was a, it, it was a, pretty crazy kind of uh, environment, very hippie, uh, totally out there kind of place. But you got to sounds learn. Sounds like a dream. Sounds, it, straight it up fantastic. sounds like a dream. Like that's <laughs> it was fantastic. And, uh, and so a lot of the people, you know, that went there became very well known. I mean, uh, very, very. So that was famous. kind of your, your creative cradle uh, where yeah, you got I'm, inoculated with uh, your initial ideas of, abstract uh, kind of design and pushing the boundaries beyond what had classically been done in, in animation. Yeah, and that was a, a big part of it. I, it. It got me to think in ways that I'd never thought about before. And so I went there for a couple of years and um, graduated with a you know degree in film and, but, uh, so really just a quick, have... quick, quick question, a little bit off topic, but sure. um, what, how, how old were you in like the 60s and uh, like late, like going into the 70s? Well, when I went, I was like, you know, 20s when I was in, 
at Cal Arts. So the young 20s. Oh, that's crazy. So you, yeah. so you live through, uh, cause now, now recently I've been reading about, uh, kind of like Timothy Leary and a lot of the big figures in oh, the sixties. Yeah. What was it yeah. like being in California at that time? Like, I'm, I'm so curious to know. And oh, for yeah, the I listeners, can... if they don't know who Timothy Leary is, he was kind of like one of the, the big, big proponents of, uh, psychedelics now it's really mainstream it's like oh microdose right. to be more creative and get more coding done if you're if right. you're in silicon valley but at the time it was very controversial and it was part of the whole movement uh in terms of and there was the vietnam war going on there's a lot the cultural oh, the context was very different for psychedelics what was it like what was right. it like uh being in the art scene in california at that time well it was interesting i w- i was just like the uh, the summer of love which was 69 i was like yeah. a couple of years after that so, um, but I, I got involved in a, a lot of things. I mean, I would go into isolation tanks and uh, uh-huh. like um, John Lilly, John Lilly, who was a proponent of that and uh, mm-hmm. studied dolphins and, and uh, interesting guy had isolation tanks. I would do that. I took Est with Werner Erhardt. If you know about that, that's sort of one of the first no, I don't. popular uh, movements that was about self-realization and uh-huh. uh, popularized the whole thing um, yeah. and it became worldwide major major movement and I got involved sort of in the first couple months of that worked at their office for a while in San Francisco um, worked at Esalen uh, Esalen Institute which is in Big Sur which is still existence and, and what, what exactly do they do? They, they're kind of like an institute that uh, helps people like self-realize. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it would be, Esalen is on the uh, cliffs of Big Sur, beautiful environment. Wow. And it yeah. was sort of a mecca for people to go and find themselves, you know, and you'd pay <laughs> a, a lot of money and you'd go there for a week and they would do all kinds of uh, So some of the first things. like retreats, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's pretty much founded that whole idea of going into Damn. self-realization, self-realization um, uh, situations. And um, yeah, I mean, we could have a whole podcast on. Yeah, on that, this. this could be a whole different I, conversation, I but we can, we can come back to it. I, well, I was completely into that and, and talking about CalArts and how how out there it was. I mean, I had a class in. Astral ray, astral ray projection and space aliens and <laughs> that was an actual class that sounds and, amazing <laughs> yeah and this guy who was uh um doing the class was a professor uh he well it showed himself as a professor in the end they found out he really wasn't a professor he was bullshit but he was an interesting <laughs> guy and he would have all these very you know, uh, long, a very articulate guy, all about uh, that how the aliens were coming and they are here. And uh, I remember once going with him and a group of us in the class to a rooftop in Santa Monica where we would look and an airplane would go by and he would say it's an alien and we'd all look and, <laughs> ah, and, and things like that. It oh was pretty, God. pretty nutty. And, um, so, you know, that kind of thing was going on. And, um, but at, at the same time, there was a lot of real world uh, learning. So it was, it was sort of a good blend because you had this very open, um, openness to what was going on in the 60s, 70s, which was mind expansion and seeing uh, different ways of looking at the potential, human potential movement. So the potential of what humans are, which is, far more than what people think it is and or think you're 100 percent and yeah. so um that was really born uh in those you know it's been going on for thousands of years but it sort of came to light in the in those north american period. culture yeah so uh it was interesting to be part of that and and being the flow being in the flow of that um, we had like Kundalini Kundalini yoga classes at CalArts, which is uh, <laughs> high intensity breathing uh, uh-huh. yoga. We had uh, Tai Chi classes, which were is fantastic. Uh, wow. uh, form of so I, I, it's it's a martial art, but it's, it is and it isn't a martial art. It's also a, a kind of like movement. energy control through the body, right? Yeah, movement meditation kind of 
uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, really got involved in a lot of those things. Uh, we had massage class, um, <laughs> you know, everything. Um, and then also a great music department there. They're sort of like Juilliard is in New York. They are in the West Coast. So wow. okay. um, I got to study with uh, like Ravi Shankar was uh, was uh, on the staff there. He wasn't there at that time, but uh, Ravi Shankar is a great sitar player. And uh, uh, then let's see, um, you know, so I got to study with some amazing um, music teachers who were from India. They had an Indian arts program. Uh, they had an African dance program. They had all these really unique uh, things that were blending together. And so, um, there was a lot going on and it was a very interesting, uh, upbringing. And, uh, but in a way, I mean, it was very interesting in terms of mind expansion, but in terms of being able to make enough money to live on, <laughs> it, it, it didn't quite make it in that department. So I remember, I had, uh, I was really good, I think, in, in uh, the independent animation movement and had films that, like, I would send out to film festivals. I won, like, uh, I won the, 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 the U.S. Student Film Festival, which was right before the Academy Awards had the Student, student uh, Academy Awards. It was right before that. It was the same, same sort of award. I won the first prize. Uh, of that for a film that I, I did at CalArts. And this was like right when you were coming out of university. Yeah, I was coming of right out of university. Uh, George Lucas had won two years before for his student film. And wow. so it was okay. a, a prestigious kind of thing. And so I was really, uh, and I got a lot of film grants. I got a film from American Institute, uh, American Film Institute and National Arts, na National, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Arts, arts and Humanities, or it's like the, uh, the Department of Arts and Humanities, I guess. Uh, Basically, like different, different, institution, different institutional grants that allowed independent filmmakers to uh, continue making great independent work and kind of uh, move their career forward, basically. Right, exactly. And, okay. uh, but I remember when I was at Cal An American arts. Film Institute, they, they're absolutely uh, amazing. I was looking at like, yeah. And we, we were chatting about this at the at the coffee shop, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's like nowadays, especially with the, the wealth of information that's available online and just through conversations like this, I think you can learn a great deal about filmmaking just through going out into the world and doing it. But if there were any uh, film school that I were to go to, it would be AFI. AFI just looks absolutely uh, wonderful in terms of uh, the way that they teach. And, uh, right. And, and just the, the wealth of amazing directors that they produced. Really, really cool institution. And, and one of the things is like, like one of the things about CalArts, which I learned, I mean, I learned animation, learned basic techniques and things like that. But, but really what I got out of it the most was just the, the relationships that I got and the people I got to know. And later on, that's why I've been able to do whatever I've, been able to do here in California oh, okay, film okay. based yeah. on those relationships and gotcha. they it's usually one person you meet that you get you know some opportunity and then that leads to the next thing and so forth so it's this cascade of relationships that happen yeah. so um that was uh you know a fortunate set of circumstances but yeah, well, um when I was uh, leaving CalArts, I remember getting a, a, a call from Hanna-Barbera. Hanna-Barbera did like Yogi Bear and all these animated films, the Jetsons and things like that. And, <laughs> no way. And, okay. And, and they had a, a animation studio here in, in North Hollywood. And yeah. um, so I remember going for an interview and showing them my abstract films that had won all these prizes and I, I thought it was really yeah, hot stuff yeah. and yeah. <laughs> they were less than impressed because <laughs> it wasn't they were like yogi this bear. is nice but what the hell can we do with this like <laughs> yeah it wasn't yogi bear and yeah, so, yeah. Uh, or the jetsons or the flintstones or any of those kind of things so um it didn't really go it's, you know it's it's really interesting uh you describing this kind of start uh in making these uh, like really abstract out there films uh i can't help but 
I feel a sense of uh, just kind of like parallels between like where I'm at right now too, because a lot of what I'm doing right now is very like abstract fashion films. And it's just kind of pushing the boundaries of ideas around uh, a lot of like a lot of stuff influenced from psychedelics and just altering ways in which we can view reality. Just very, very out there stuff that I think Mm -hmm. is just like beautiful. Uh, And as I progress and I'm looking to do more things, uh, I'm starting to encounter, I'm like, yeah, okay. So uh, when I go to make, uh, let's say, a TV show or a movie, uh, it's you're automatically in a very different world. And while those ideas are valuable uh, and just absolutely fascinating, it's how do you then take something very abstract and turn it into something very clear that can be communicated to a wider audience? Right. Is that right. kind of what you were realizing yeah, no, at that point? No, very you- much. I mean, I always wanted to be commercially successful 100%. as well as artistic, pure, artistically pure and, pure and things like that. What and, more can uh, we hope for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stay that's true the best to your vision and, and, uh, yeah. and make it financially it. sustainable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, so I, um, I thought about that a lot. Um, at that point, I had moved to New York. Uh, I had... Say so I lived in, in um, Boston for a little while, and then I moved back to Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, mm-hmm. where I was um, uh, living with at my mom's house because I had I had this uh, AFI grant, American Film Institute grant, but I didn't have enough money to really. I just wanted to dedicate myself to that, so I sort of hold myself, uh, you know, hold held hold myself hold myself up in uh, my bedroom there and, and just uh, sort of worked on my film. And yeah. um, it, it's interesting about, I mean, I'm giving you the full story here. It's like Fayetteville, it, it was an interesting town. It was a place that I, when I was young, I wanted to, to go to California. My, I had spent some time in California, a summer uh, in the 60s where my dad taught at UCLA. And I remember, being in Santa Monica and saying, this is where I want to live. It's just so awesome. And I want to be here. So that's sort of set the tone for going to California. <laughs> I've had um, similar experiences coming from uh, Toronto, going out to California to visit family when I was young, just being like, this is where I need to be. The, yeah. just the culture, the weather, the atmosphere is. Yeah. Fantastic. It's awesome. And Santa Monica, especially, I and mean, it's a great, great little venue. And 100%. so um, I remember being back in Arkansas and thinking, oh, this is, you know, nothing's happening here and all that. <laughs> but a lot was going on. Um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. There was uh, a guy who had a dime store in the, uh, the center of town. Actually, he had one in, in his town, which it was a couple of towns up in north of Arkansas. And then he had a little a dime store there. Um, Sorry, he had a, did you say a dime store? Wait, what is that? Yeah, like a dime store. It's like a five and dime. Uh, it's like um, it's like uh, wall. Um, what was it? Walgreens or um, got you, got you. C- it, uh, kind of, CSB. It's, it's like, yeah, like that. CVS, kind of thing. CVS. Yeah, like yeah. sort of a drugstore type. Anything, uh, but although it doesn't have the the pharmacy, it just has. <gasps> The abstract board game for two players. Oh, just a second. <laughs> uh, Alexa is, is trying to get it on the act. Just said, let me turn her off. <laughs> no worries, no worries. That always happens. It's like That's so you start funny. talking and then your iPhone starts listening to you and saying, what did you say? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, you, what was that? What was Can that? I help you? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, he, he, and then he started, like when I was growing up, he started, he had an idea that, um, we're here in the rural part of the country and we really mm-hmm. want to have uh, goods that everyone can buy. So we opened a place called Gibson's in the, in the, um, in the roller rink that was like outside of town and you go there and you can buy all these kind of things. And anyway, it evolved uh, further and further. And, um, and then uh, he changed uh, uh, the name of it, and it got a little more successful. His name was Sam Walton, and uh, so it's Walmart. And so uh, Mr. Sam, as we would call him, uh, 
started it, and it it was in still the world headquarters is in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is okay. just a little bit uh, north of Fayetteville, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty amazing place. I was there uh, a few months ago, and uh, it's it's a pretty spectacular environment. But uh, anyway, so I didn't think anything was happening, and yet you know Walmart was starting down the street, you know, and that was going on. A lot of people I went to high school with ended up, you know whether you uh, love or hate Walmart, it became a, uh, the idea initially was very, very sound. And uh -huh. that became good. And then, um, then one day my mom was, I was uh, down drawing uh, animation and my mom said, hey, Rick, and they call me Rick uh, rather than Eric uh, when I grew up in Arkansas because that was just, uh, because there was another Eric, Eric Kramer, who I went to school with, and we had to distinguish between the two, and so I became Rick. Which <laughs> actually, ended up with sort okay. of a cooler, cooler name than Eric when I grew up, and then it became Eric later. But um, so my mom uh, said, "I had this, uh, you know, one of our neighbors just came in who just moved in, and and uh, I want you to meet him." So I, I went upstairs, and and there's this guy, and and uh, so we started having breakfast and talking, and uh, he said. Um, he just started teaching law school. And so uh, we're having breakfast and, and we're saying how, what would you like to do with your life? And, and I said, well, I want to be a filmmaker because I think that's the greatest thing in the world. And so I remember uh, showing him my animated film, lying, uh, sitting on the, on the floor and sort of flipping through and saying how cool it was. And, and so that's why I'm And at that time, it. you like literally physically flipping yeah, pages. Yeah, to... flipped it. Yeah, flipped it. And he thought that was pretty <laughs> cool. And then, so I said, what, yeah. do you, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I, uh, I'm teaching law, but, you know, I really want to get into, po I'm into public service. I really want to be a public servant. And I think, you know, that uh, if you're going to do anything, you've got to do, do it the best you can ever be. You do it the best you know, go, go to, to the, the highest standard possible. Go to the high, highest standard. So I would be in public service. So you know what? I think I'm going to be, I want to be president of the United States. I said, really? And, and he said, yeah, I, I think I want to be president of the United States. And I didn't quite get it. I didn't think that was right. But my neighbor was Bill Clinton, who uh, became the president of the United States. And, uh, <laughs> oh, you should. And, and I always remember that with Bill. It's like talking to him and having that vision and um, thinking nothing much was going on in Arkansas, but down the street was Walton's, uh, Walmart was being built and my neighbor was the next president of the United States. Next so, president of the United States. Yeah, so God so damn that damn. was pretty, pretty wild. So that was my little uh, time when I was doing my animated film um, in Arkansas. And then I ended up, uh, moving to uh, New York and living in Manhattan, and um, did did and, um couple couple questions about your time in Arkansas was that kind yeah. of like I'm guessing you did feel a lot of uh, pressure at that time to kind of figure it out right because you're working on your film you're trying to get that going you have this grant but uh, in term other than that there's not a lot going on at that point. Like what was what was kind of like your mindset at the time while you were trying to figure out what was what was your what your next steps kind of were uh, or were you just kind of taking it as as it went like just kind of like living it day by day and doing what you were doing and did any of that vision of like like let's say like Bill Clinton like that you're talking about that conversation you had and uh, it sound for what it sounds like is that what you got from that conversation was that ability to see a vision of what you wanted to build with your life and then right. execute upon it. Right. So I mean, that was a couple a, different questions that, there, but right, right. No, that was a big part of it. I was, I was impressed at the moment. I didn't believe he would actually end up doing that. <laughs> I thought that was impossible, but you know, yeah, yeah. it, it got realized. Um, and then my, my goal at that point was just trying to get the film done because I had mm -hmm. a commitment to the AFI and, and I wanted to get it done. And I knew I couldn't really, I felt probably more than more so than was necessary that if I had that everything hinged on this movie that I had to get this this animated film done if I didn't get it done if it wasn't spectacular nothing would happen ever again and yeah um, yeah so a lot of pressure that, 
it was a lot of pressure, but I was putting that more on myself than what it Into was. Into the work. Yeah. And so uh, the, the film I ended up making, you know, was shown a little bit, but it wasn't that great because it, it just, um, this is when I was trying to um, become more, less abstract and in filmmaking and more, um, let's see, uh, more commercially viable. So I wanted to do a more realistic film. So it was sort of a hybrid between the two. It wasn't really, it wasn't a great, um, visual film, it was sort of in between both. It was a growth, growth film. So, um, but anyway, I ended up living in New York and New York is a, at that point, it's more a film center right now, but it was, at that point it was, and this was the 70s, so it was more, uh, actually it was, uh, late 70s, early 80s, it was more a uh, financial center, which it still is, and, but, but less, film going on, and, but a big mm. art scene. And so I was there and completely in the art scene. There's a whole independent animated uh, group that was there. Uh, we would get together and, and, and sort of more, uh, uh, you know, a, a hybrid of, of film and, and painters and artists and things like that. And so it was a great experience to be there. Um, and then I started to get into uh, commercials. I, a friend of mine that I knew through, um, I forget exactly how I met her, but um, um, anyway, through I think it was through this independent animation group. I met this, this woman who was working in a company called the Harold Friedman Consortium. And Harold had a consortium, which was like about 20 filmmakers around the, the world who were independent filmmakers, but he was able to get commercial jobs for them, commercials. So I was uh, hired okay. to so like- So agency of sorts. An agency of sorts, yeah. It's more like a, a gotcha. talent agency for those kind of people. Mm -hmm. But he, instead of getting 10%, he would get 50%. <laughs> oh, budget. holy shit, okay. He would never <laughs> communicate that to you, but uh, I discovered that. <laughs> and so that was a little alarming, but, um, Anyway, uh, so I would do cold calling. So my job was to um, call ad agencies. There's a thing called the Red Book, which became pivotal later on in my journey. Uh, the Red Book was, is sort of, the, and I, the I guess Red it's still Book. around. It's a dic the Red Book is a dictionary, of, or it's a like sort of an encyclopedia or a, a phone book, I guess, of all the ad agencies, who works at the ad agencies, what they're um, accounts are who you know what the structure is in the agency and and what their billings are oh, okay. and, and so forth so my job yeah. was to cold cold call these agencies and try to find find, <laughs> find somebody and send them reels and 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 get business so it was a really interesting thing to do it was drudgery when i was doing it because i wasn't really feeling like that what, what I was meant to do, but I got to learn about ad agencies and advertising in New York. I got to meet a lot of people in advertising. And then later on, I was added to the roster of, of artists and filmmakers. So I decided that my cold calling was over. I really wanted to do uh, film. And so I ended up um, doing quite a bit of work, animated uh, work in New York, which was character driven, but more cartoony kind of driven stuff and uh, doing a lot of uh, commercials, which I love doing and it was great. Um, and then um, I was living in a, uh, uh, a building at 90th and first, uh, between 90 and 91st Street at, on First Avenue, sort of a, a walk up uh, railroad apartment, which is an apartment that's just all one, one long line here, a kitchen at the end and and sort of a bathroom and, and living room and everything sort of in one yeah. line at yeah, once. Yeah. And so as a railroad. Um, and also my wife and I uh, were having a child at that point. And then we had another apartment on East 87th Street. Uh, and, but I was keeping the railroad apartment as a studio, which is totally illegal in New York. You can't, or at that point, you, you had to have a business license and a business so it'd be a uh, okay. space or a living space. It wasn't combined, and that was sort of before everyone worked at home. So it was uh, yeah, now. Yeah. Now I don't think the laws really apply anymore. 
But um, at that point, I had like 10 people working for me at Eric Durst Films, and I had my own little little department, and I had ink, inkers wow. and painters, and they would come to the railroad apartment, and I had a long, <laughs> long table of people working. And uh, this guy, John, who owned the building, had a deli down below, and every morning, he'd see these people come in and never leave. And he said, what? what the hell's going on? It's like all these people are going. And then, then at the end of the day, like a, a flood of people come out and it's like, what was going on? And so, and um, were these all commercials at this point that you were working? Yeah, on? these were commercials. And then I did um, a film. So for, I'm guessing yeah. that like during this time when you're running Eric Durst films, that's probably when you got a sense of uh, what it takes to not just work with the team, but manage a team and understand yeah. what it takes to, uh, do projects that are more than a, a, a one-man show. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you're a one-man band for a while, you end up doing everything together and or all, all the different jobs. And sometimes it's hard to give up the, uh, you know, touching everything. And, <laughs> and so yeah, it's difficult yeah. to become a manager where the ultimate goal is really to replace yourself, to, to have everyone do all those jobs and you manage. Uh, but I was doing a combination of both. I was animating as well as uh, directing and managing this. Um, and so it was, it was difficult because you get a big check and then you'd have to sort of disperse it out and make sure it lasted until the next check. And, um, but it was okay. I mean, it, it was enough, you know, everyone was sort of making where I was making enough to uh, survive, but it it was it was tricky. Um, and then I was also teaching at Philadelphia College of Art. I was teaching animation there one day a week, so I would take a train nice. to uh, to Philly and uh, and do that. And then once uh, I came back to the apartment, and there was no water, and there was no uh, I think power was still on, but there was no water, and it's like what's going on? And though so then I discovered that my landlord was basically trying to find out what was going on. And so he turned the water off. So I'd go down and talk <laughs> to him. And, uh, and so um, he discovered I was running a, uh, a studio. Legal and, business. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a, a, a legal, quite legally kind of business. And, um, yeah, yeah, and so yeah, yeah. I was evicted. And so I got an eviction uh, notice. And so then I had to decide, had to decide whether to stay in New York, get a proper place, really make this a business or do something else. And the last project I had done there, last commercial, I had um, uh, hired two of my friends who I knew from uh, California and one from Arkansas, Alan. And uh, uh, so they were, in California. And so they said, why don't you come to California? And I think we can get you a job at Disney if you want to come. And why don't you just come out? So um, I had a one year old at that time. And it was time to sort of it just felt like the time to sort of uh, change gears. And because there's just more film work in in California, because it's like if you're into cars, that's you go to Detroit, you know, that's just the what happens, or you want to do certain kind of software design and you go to Silicon Valley, it, you know, it's like that's that just kind what of it thing. Is. It's, 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 yeah. it's the environment yeah. that it's going on. So you, you broke up, you broke up for a sec there. What was that? Yeah. So, uh, so we decided that it was time to move to uh, California. Gotcha. And so um, I got in the car and I drove first, my wife and and child uh, flew and she stayed with her brother for a while and, and just sort of, I, I came to California to sort of work it out. And um, I've had a lot of instances where I've just sort of been at the right place at the right time, really, there's no other way to explain it. So I ended up coming to California and staying uh, with my friends, Liz and Alan. And, um, and the first week I was there, Alan, Alan Blythe was, uh, uh, an animator and he was at Disney and they were doing a film called Tron and it was uh, if you know Tron the movie. Of course, yeah. and uh, so <laughs> he said why don't you come over and, and maybe I can get you a job so I came over and I met with uh, 
people there. I met with Barry Cook, who has become a very famous uh, animation director. And Barry was an animator, animating. He needed a, needed an assistant. And so I said, yeah, I, you know, I'll do it. And so uh, I had been in California like three days. And so I immediately got a job at Disney, which was pretty <laughs> nice. And so then we went upstairs. They had a little sort of a donut shop upstairs in the yeah. uh, animation building at the, at, uh, at the Disney studio. And on the wall was a, a little uh, uh, sort of a community board, you know, with all these different things up there and then one was like for renting um, a house um, in Burbank and so I said that sounds great and so I went and rented that house and so within like four days basically I came to California got there had a job had a house had it all together and I just thought that was the way it was you know that was just easy you know <laughs> and uh, not I was very fortunate let's say in doing that and so um, I worked at Disney on uh, Tron which was an interesting experience because it was like we always called it the first handmade or uh, first hand-drawn uh, computer animated film uh, because it was it was it was sort of presented as the one of the first computer made film and it was about computers it was about living in a video yeah game. yeah um, and it was also done with a lot of very, you know, at that point, sort of cutting edge computer technology. Yeah, well, I've, I've seen the, the recent Tron. I haven't, so you're, what you're talking about is the is original Tron. The original. This is there in like what, 1982? 1981, 8081, yeah, it came in 81. That's incredible. And with Jeff Bridges, it was there, it was doing, it was in the film and, um, and it was like pretty, a, pretty mind-bending kind of thing during that time and so um what so you what would, moved to california and you stumble on to one of the most ex exciting cutting edge uh, <laughs> uh kind of uh animation vfx uh, things that are going on in the industry at the time right in like three and a half days yeah so yeah. <laughs> it was quite fortunate and it's the first time they had opened the disney studio um to a you know, to the outside, really, until then, everyone sort of came to Disney, did the Disney style, Disney films, and um, you had to sort of go up through the ranks, and there was a whole structure Very of doing that. Very bureaucratic. Yeah, and, um, and so this is the first time they just opened the doors and said, look, this is a, a completely different kind of film. We don't know how to do this. Just open it up. So a lot of people that had worked at Robert, Robert Abel and Associates. Uh, Bob Abel had um, a commercial house in LA, which was doing computer animation, sort of the first major successful uh, commercial house to do commercials that was driven by computer technology. But at that point, computer technology was wireframe. And so uh, during Tron, we had, um, if you, a famous sequence in that movie is called a uh, motorcycle sequence. And it's where uh, Jeff Bridges and I think Bruce Boxleiter, who was also one of the stars of it, had, had this sort of duel. They're these in, in these sort of uh, speeder bikes and they're going back and forth like this. And um, it's a very famous scene. And so what would, what would happen is, is it got designed and then it would go to uh, Elmsford, New York. And in Elmsford, they had like a computer uh, company that would grind out the wireframes of, of the motorbike and the environment. And they would send it over a phone modem. You actually put a phone on this little, little uh, receiver <laughs> and you would, uh, you know, telephone call these beeps, <laughs> like beep, 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 yeah, beep, yeah, beep, yeah, beep, yeah, beep, sort of like Morse yeah. code. And it would read it on the other line, which was basically bits. And it took 15 minutes per frame to uh, have this. <laughs> and then you would get like a, an outline uh, of, the, of the- So basically um, you would transfer the data through audio over the phone lines. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's incredible. And, That's incredible. And then it was uh, built on Evans and Sutherland computers, which uh, NS machines, which were some of the first, um, you know, high-end computer workstations. 
And so, uh, but what we would do is we would take those lines that they give, give to us and we would put that on film and then make codalists. Codalists are like high contrast um, acetate, which was like uh, 16 by 11 or something like that. It was like, you know, pretty, pretty big. And um, you would take those lines and basically photographically you would have black where there was nothing in a line, pure um, uh, clear where that was. And you would paint where there are little, uh, little uh, dots, you know, imperfections and things like that. But then you would take those and shoot them on a down shooter. A down shooter is like an animation camera where normal uh, hand-drawn animation was done. So it was like a camera up above and then a, a, uh, like a table here, which is underlit. And then you would project light through, uh, through that and usually put a gel on it. Let's say if you wanted a red line, you'd put a red gel on it. And the camera would see this red line, and you would project. It would be so basically, so basically, what you're what you're kind of saying is that you use uh, various translucent layers uh, right. that filtered out different bandwidths of light to create uh, red or blue or whatever different colors you needed to right. then physically create uh, some of the elements that you were seeing on screen, in addition right. to the computer generated graphics that were right that were happening remotely in New York while you were putting the movie together in California. Right, right. Okay. And then they would photograph, they photograph the film, just uh, like you'd have uh, Jeff Bridges and all the other players photographed, and they would take each frame of that film, and if you ever look at it, they have these um, outfits that have these sort of lines on them. If you look at Tron, they all have these sort of lines yeah, on them. And they were like, uh, there was a certain light that you could project on them and they, these lines would glow on their outfits. So it was sort of an interesting, weird look. And we would make these large black and white photographs. And so you would do a multi-pass, um, uh, photography of these elements. So you first element you would shoot, I'm simplifying, but basically the first element would be the black and white photograph of the live action. So I'm, you know, I'm here, let's say, and you photograph me. So I have myself in black and white. And then I would have the line drawing uh, of, of, let's say I'm, I'm throwing something and there's like a uh, computer ball or something like that. So I had the line of the computer ball. I would expose that on the next pass. On another pass, I might highlight different colors on the uh, the outfit that they have. Multiple passes. So sometimes you. So get like when you say pass, essentially you're saying like layers. So you're saying layers. like multiple layers of exposure of the the film to, right. and then you you'd merge those together and uh, create the final image. Right, it's, it's like in uh, After Effects <laughs> or something where you have multiple layers. Layers, uh, yeah. You would do those photographically. So you would have the first pass, you do yeah, it, and then yeah. you would have to uh, shut the lens, crank the film back to zero again, put the next layer in of exposure, uh, expose it again, uh, and go back and, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you're shooting blind. So you don't really know, you do tests to sort of figure out what the exposures are, but it's not like an After Effects or, or any compositing program, Nuke or anything, or, or Premiere, or, you know, where you can look at layers and you can adjust them in real time with a monitor. You have to sort of know what your exposure is. Send are, it to the lab, adjust, bring it back, and it then the lab, bring it back and look at it and say, oh, that's a little too bright, or that's a little too dark, or whatever. I'm <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was a pretty laborious thing. So that's why yeah, I call it yeah. a hand-drawn animated film because it was like uh, some of the parts were generated with computer but it was really hand drawn very much like disney films mm -hmm. and so um ended up uh, uh doing that and that sort of introduced me to a lot of people who are in the in the commercial field and areas of um you know visual effects because uh, I've never done visual effects at that point, just animation. So up until this point in your career, now what you do these days is you're a VFX supervisor. So you're kind of in charge of creating uh, all the CGI and films. But up until this point, you were just in animation. 
Right. I guess animation. VFX wasn't as much a thing. Uh, uh, it wasn't. I mean, at that days. point, there were only a few, and there were only a few um, houses in the world. I mean, Star Wars had already come out. Uh, Ap uh, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, which became it split. There's a whole story there with John Dykstra. It, it's like app. It, it they, they created uh, Star Wars. Um, there were like you know some films there, but there were only like about maybe four houses in four or five houses in the world that did visual effects. Wow. And so um, through a relationship that I I met. A friend of mine, uh, who I gone to Cal Arch with, he he said, "Why don't you come to a party?" I went to a party. I met some people. Long story short, uh, they needed somebody to uh, work on an animated commercial um, at a company called Dream Quest, which is one of the five houses that did visual effects. And that was nice. all at that point. It was doing miniatures and motion control. It was all photochemical it wasn't there was no electronic compositing at that point and so I went and I animated some um, uh, you know animated uh, uh, you know commercials and things like that worked with a woman named Linda Wyman and uh, Linda was interesting also she um, uh, Linda and I were I'm in this little sort of uh, attic and we would work for like about six months on on commercials and things like that. Linda went on uh, be, to become a teacher and um, opened a company called Linda.com. I don't know if you are familiar with Linda.com. Yeah. <laughs> no way, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's Linda. And, uh, so, and that's a whole other story. That's she, wild. That's wild. She, she had her first company in Ojai, which uh, is where I lived. And, and she and her husband, Bruce, lived there and they for started really very very small and uh became just started uh, putting up tutorials teaching people different things all that yeah very all cool that. and what and what what year was this in that was probably 80 that was 84 83 84 god damn okay 84 yeah and so yeah. then um i so just what, to what kind of kind of summarize so like up until this point uh so you, you kind of started out in arkansas as having a rich uh, upbringing in this uh, university reminiscent of the German Bauhaus where uh, yeah. you were surrounded by all these different arts from dance to theater to architecture. Uh, you studied architecture for a little bit, painting, got into film, uh, did a couple of different grants, moved to New York, uh, and now you're in California and this is when uh, uh, you're, you're kind of getting to uh, start to work on the films that you wanted to when you were back in your room in Arkansas. Right, right. So it sort of came to be through a circuitous route. You know, you never know quite where the path is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. a lot of fortune and a lot of sort of knowing people. And, you know, a lot of it is the network. I mean, a lot of it's who you meet because all these these things that happen to me are really casual relationships that you have you know people that you know and they sort of yeah, yeah. help in one way or another and you sort of meet people along the way and one thing leads to another and you know you so, said something really interesting to me when we were uh, when we bumped into bumped into each other at the coffee shop and i think you were mentioning when you're in when you're getting interviewed for any sort of job at this level at the level of feature films it becomes less so about what your skill level is in terms of can you get the job done because everyone who's coming in for the interview can get the job done right it's not about the skill set anymore it's about uh and you you said it there's a really uh, interesting uh i guess scenario oh not really a metaphor like let's say you're on a plane with this person for 12 hours this is what you were telling right. me could right. you have a interesting conversation uh if this person was sitting next to you on a plane for 12 hours. And right. if you could, that's what's really going to determine whether you land this gig or not, because it's not really about uh, the skill set on set. It's about the chemistry. Right. And that really resonated with me because what I'm finding as I spend more time in film is that it's not, uh, it, it's, it, it's not, it's not about the skill set of any one individual on the crew. It's about everyone putting their ego aside to make something bigger than any one of them could individually. Right. That's right. It's the airplane test. 
So yeah, the airplane it, does it, that. And, 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 that, and that really is what it is. There's also, also we're talking about um, when you interview, there's, there's just, there's physical stamina. So it's like mm-hmm. film is hard. I mean, it takes a lot out of you. You have to work long hours and very intensely and you have to be on it all the time. So there's a, a physical um, pr- preparedness that you need, but really what trumps everything or what sort of goes above everything is uh, your ability to work with somebody because you're spending so much time with people. They want to, you want to be somebody that they want to be around, you know, and, yeah, or, yeah, or don't yeah. mind being around, let's say. <laughs> and, and so uh, that really is, that's important, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And you build relationships that way. And that's really how it's all driven. Because when people say Hollywood is a place, it's not really a place, it's a network. Mm. And there is no Hollywood. There is the, the connection of people in film. And mm-hmm. that's what that is. And so I could see, go down to Hollywood and Vine or Hollywood Boulevard, and I see these people looking around, you know, looking at the, the stars on the sidewalk and going to the museums and stuff like that and thinking that's Hollywood or going to the Universal uh, tour, which actually is pretty yeah. good tour, but uh, you go to that and they think, oh, this is Hollywood, and it's not. I mean, that's not what it is. It is a, a it's a physical of representation of something that's uh, right. that exists in around the world in terms of uh, a networking and uh, rec- record, kind of like recognition, right? right. Like, yeah, kind of like real recognizes real in terms of like you know. Uh, who can get the job done and you know who you can rely on to get that done. Right. Whether they're and in Australia or Montreal or right. wherever. And it's layers and layers of relationships. And it, and the, the relationships you think are just, well, this is just my buddy that, you know, I'm doing this with or whatever. I mean that they're more valuable than you can ever imagine because um, one thing always leads to another, to another, to another, to another. And you can look back and say, look back 15 years and say, oh, well, uh, I had no idea at the time that that this one thing would lead to the other. And um, so it's, it's important to like, you know, to create that, that network of, of people that you know. And, um, and, it just, and it takes a long time. You can't just sit here and just have it happen. It's just you, you take jobs that you can get because that gets you in the gate and, and you meet people while you're there. So it's, uh, so I say, you know, you got to get in the river and uh, you got to find the river and the river doesn't necessarily have to be in California. It can be in a lot of places because films are made everywhere, but you want to do whatever you can to, you know, get in the gates and because um, there's a real big difference between being on a, on a project, on a film versus just hearing about it. It's like when you're on, on a production and working in any capacity, that can be from somebody just bringing the coffee in to somebody, you know, who's directing. Uh, any, any, you know, part of that, you are part of this network and you get to know everybody. And um, it's always interesting and you always learn things. So you learn, you can learn so much in school, but you really, uh, to me, school is, is certainly you learn skill sets, but you really learn your skill sets when you're out working. You need to know enough to get in the game. But um, the most important thing is, is the people that you meet along the way. Yeah, I think I guess it comes down to to your uh, state of being and the energy that you're bringing to uh, uh, to 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 the workplace and just not not even I I, I <laughs> it's funny to say workplace when I think about a set because I don't I don't see it uh, as like a, a quote unquote workplace I see it as like a uh, a group of people coming together to uh, work on work on a wonderful project whatever that is right um and it's it's interesting that you mention uh, kind of your history uh when you were in in college at caltech uh mm-hmm. kind of Calix, uh, like yeah. Cal- oh sorry one second yeah. right. my microphone
Um, okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, learn <laughs> when you were at Cal Arts, and you were you, you were uh, learning about kind of self realization and these other companies outside of the film industry that you worked on. That must have had such a profound effect on uh, your ability to bring the right energy like day after day uh, on those strenuous film sets and put the put your best foot forward. Well, you think about it. I mean, sometimes it gets really hard. I mean, honestly, I mean, it's, it's pretty tough sometimes. And sometimes it's like you wonder why you're there. I mean, you're, you're in the middle of some freezing field out in the middle of nowhere. And it's like, <laughs> why on earth are we here? And it's cold and it's raining and it's just like yeah. you know, dire circumstances. And, uh, but you get through it and, um, you know, it's like a battle sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's very simple and, and it's uh, straightforward and easy. Sometimes it's, it's the most difficult thing you'll ever do. Mm -hmm. So you need to have sort of the ability to go to both ends of the spectrum. Um, but I, I feel like I've, a, a thing that has been valuable to me, and first of all, the animation background has been great because animation is sort of the foundation of everything I do. It's about movement, and gravity and being able to like if you can make something with a pencil and paper if you can make that come to life then you understand a lot about the dynamics of what happens in film because in film it's like a frame and things move in that frame and um and you get a certain energy from that movement and from the performance and so you learn a lot if you can break it down to the most uh, basic form, and it's a good discipline to, to have. And so it's not photographic, what it looks like, it's more about how it feels. And that's the kind of thing that I try to bring to animation, mm -hmm. uh, or I mean to uh, uh, visual effects. And I've sort of been in all different kind of phases. I mean, I've been in independent animation, I've been into uh, what, what happened at at, at uh, DreamQuest is I came back. They wanted to, uh, they needed somebody to run their um, uh, commercial department because at that point there were no visual effects in commercials, if you can imagine. Um, huh. It was all pho photochemical, not electronic. And mm -hmm. so, um, so there was a, a guy who was from New York uh, who sort of was, like the the godfather of, of commercials there it was a little strange but uh anyway he came to us and came to this company and wanted to give them a bunch of commercials and uh big end commercials they needed an executive producer and because if you remember when i was talking about the red book when i was in uh new york yeah yeah um so when i interviewed with the guys at dream quest to be involved in commercials after having done a stint with a, a animation um, they, uh, I knew what the red book was. I said, well, I know the red book. The red book is the encyclopedia of, of, of commercials. And they were very impressed by that because they said, oh, if you know what the red book is, we don't know what the red book is. You obviously know what commercials are. So you're the guy. So I got the job as, as executive <laughs> producer. So I, I, I sort of started the, it was the first, uh, first or second, it's like sort of the the, it was the first commercial division in a visual effects company in the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, now it became sort of standard. And then ILM and uh, all of these other companies uh, formed commercial divisions. But at that point, it was sort of the first time we had uh, put together commercials and, and uh, visual effects. And so we did a lot of commercials. I wanted to direct. And so, it, again, it was one of those fortuitous kind of events where we had commercials. I remember uh, I had a desk and we had like, I think three commercials from General Electric. We had two from, um, uh, uh, three from Dodge, um, a number from other companies. And they were just sort of all there. And because no one had really done visual effects and commercials, it wasn't even a bidding thing. It was just like, can you do it? And so, <laughs> We said yes, and I said, you know, I really would like to direct, so uh, may, I'll do this Dodge commercial. Okay, yeah, great, yeah. fine. And so they let me direct, and so there were no That's a wonderful or... position to be in when it's not about the competition. It's like you are the, uh, you are the niche. You are the market, uh, right. which is, I think, a position that's, I think, 
it's always wonderful to strive to be in because when you're competing, it's always a race to the bottom. But when you're, when you're creating something entirely new, not, not only are you staying true and original to what you're trying to do, you're offering the market something that is never seen before. So you get to set right. the price, you get to set the, the rules and right. games. That's games. your leverage. That's yeah. the leverage. I mean, that's what Linda did with uh, lynda.com also. I mean, she was the first person to really, first company to get uh, tutorials online. And um, because she had such a huge library, she was able to leverage that and stay ahead and then end up selling it to LinkedIn for an exorbitant amount you know, of money and, and uh, yeah, yeah. do very well with it uh, because he was first to market. And, uh, and in a way, visual effects was sort of at that point first to market. So um, it was uh, yeah, a time where you could sort of make your way. And so I ended up, uh, directing commercials for like about 12 years and doing a lot of big campaigns. Uh, I at one point did three years of all of Volkswagen's commercials in the United States. Oh, I did that's five amazing. years of all Black and Decker's commercials. I did um, uh, Polaroid when Polaroid was a company still. I did a number of their commercials. I did um, just pretty much every corporation in the world did commercials for them and um, then ended up going to, um, it was time to sort of change a venue. And so I got a call from um, Apogee. Apogee was the company that did, visual effects company that did Star Wars, the first Star Wars. They were the first uh, Industrial Light and Magic ILM. That's what they formed, or what yeah. John Dykstra formed to uh, do the visual effects for the first Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And then later, Lucas, George Lucas wanted to move to Marin County and go north, and John wanted to stay here. So he became Apogee, and then ILM became ILM up in Northern California. And um, <clears throat> so they were doing, at that point, um, people were starting to do electronic compositing. And the, there was a company called CIS, which is Composite Image Systems. They were in California, uh, they were in Los Angeles in a sort of a, a garage, and they were doing pin registered transfers. So if you had film, film would like weave and gates. So if you ever look at film on a, uh, like a, like a film projector, it's, it, everything sort of weaves in the gate. And so they were able to do what's called pin registered transfers. So they did pin registered, so rock steady transfers. So you could take that image, it would go to tape, and you could, uh, because everything was steady, you could do multiple layers together. And that was sort of the first electronic compositing. And that was done in commercials because the resolution was at a low resolution state. It was uh, uh, seven, uh, I forget now what it was, 728 by 400 or something like that. I mean, it was like, it was very low resolution, but uh, you were able to do commercials that way. So a lot of us, several of us became, um, uh, went into commercials because we, I went into commercials, I love, love commercials, but, but a lot of um, visual effects supervisors went into uh, commercials because they could do electronic compositing. And it was the first time we could ever do that. So um, I was invited uh, uh, to Join Apogee with John Dykstra, and John John was uh, doing com directing commercials, and I was directing commercials. So we were sort of the commercial division there, and um, and then Trip Guber, who was another director, was part of that. So three of us were the commercial directors, and did that for a year, um, and then the company folded for various reasons, and I wanted to get into. Uh, film. So I remember having lunch with John, John Dykstra, and he was working on a Batman movie at Warner Brothers. And, and another very fortuitous kind of event happened because I uh, asked John, I said, hey, John, I'd really like to, how do I get into, uh, I've been doing commercials for a long time. I love doing commercials, but how, how do I, do you think I can get into film? And so he said, well, I need somebody to um, supervise uh, Gotham City for Batman, would you like to do that? I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, two days later, I was on a set with 200 people, and we were building Gotham City for um, two Fantastic. Batmans. Fantastic, yeah. Aren't the best. It was like Batman forever. 
and yeah, yeah. Um, but they were using maxatures, which were like 30, 30 to 40 foot miniature buildings and giant, um, I have some great pictures of that. I mean, great motion control cameras that would go through these. these <laughs> so I ended up doing, a, a, but that's yeah. how I got into film. And it was sort of a, a very fortunate thing. And then went from there and went to another Batman movie with John and then did uh, Spider-Man with John. Also did some work with him on that. Uh, that was uh, Spider-Man 2, right? Spider-Man 2. Um, and then did a lot of other uh, films and then really got into the film world. At that point, a lot of people were doing commercials and it became more competitive and it wasn't as fun. It wasn't like, oh, I'll do that one anymore. It was like you had to uh, really go It was a bidding a war at that point. It's a bidding war at that point. And then yeah. that's a race to the bottom and that becomes not so great. So um, I really wanted to go full time into features and that's where I got into features. And, and then one thing sort of led to an another and then I've been doing features from that point on. Uh, recently, I've done a lot of television work because uh, streaming world and things like that in the hybridation mm -hmm. or the combination of of film and TV is really, uh, they're all sort of one the same right now in terms of resolution in the work. And just the distribution is so huge. And uh, that's really where everything's going. And this odd period of time for all of us where people are quarantined and things like that, I think those streaming services are going to have great uh, uh, you know, business. A lot of people are going to be 100%, 100%. in their homes. And um, in general, it's the way of the future, right? Like people aren't going out as much. It's right. straight to your own home uh, on your laptop, on your phone, on your TV, whatever you want to do right. straight to you. It's fantastic. Easy, simple. And, done. and you can get huge, amazing like OLED screens. I mean, you can get enormous, you know, screens for, you know, not that they're free, but they're, they're certainly a much less than they used to be. And you can get pretty magnificent sound system and you can make a home theater that shows movies, you know, and, yeah. and so that's, so there's, there's, uh, no loss of appetite for, uh, quality for quality or for yeah. Yeah. entertainment. And so that's where it's going. So um, and, yeah. one, one question that I was pretty eager to ask you was, yeah. um, so talking to you now, uh, I get a sense that, after so how many how many years has your career spanned at this point it's been over 40 years now yeah that's congratulations yeah. that's incredible yeah, and after 40 years you still sound so excited and uh oh, yeah. just like ready to jump into the next thing and uh thankful for the opportunity opportunities that you've had in the past right but also just like uh, excited and engaged with what's in front of you and all the while you're working on these incredibly grueling projects. Like mm -hmm. I know when you were here in Toronto, uh, you said that you were balancing three different feature films or three different, uh, whether right. it was like a TV show and a feature film, three different major projects at the same mm -hmm. time, right. uh, which is a lot to handle. And you're talking about how uh, you're on set on in these cold fields in the middle of the night. Uh, you would yeah. tell me sometimes staying up for two, three days at a time with little to no sleep. Right. And I can see you still got the love for it. <laughs> yeah. What what keeps you uh, going? What keeps you? What what enables you to stay in peak states of creativity and bring that energy forward? Forty years. I think it's, deep. Yeah. No, I think it's a challenge. I mean, to me, it's like a test, and it's like I love making films, but it's not necessarily about the film. It's about. Uh, the people you work with and the dynamics of a film. I'm always fascinated by that. Like how okay. it's like this machine that you're in, this energy machine. And, and so I like to challenge myself and, and like to see if I can do it, you know, and visual effects is interesting because there's so much technologically um, there, you know, there's so much evolution that goes on in that world that, um, just being engaged in the uh, visual technology is is always uh, something you have to learn new things all the time and you have to build new skill sets all the time and so just that part alone is is always interesting there's always something if you're curious there's always something new that you can uh, uh, 
you know, le learn about and, and get involved with. So that's exciting. Um, I uh, just like that the, the longer you're in it, the more you gain, the sort of more mastery of it is that you learn, but you, you're always learning more. So in a way you're, you're just like a kid in kindergarten. I mean, because you don't know a lot of things that you learn. So it's, it's an environment that enables you to learn a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of new information. And you yeah. also get to engage with some pretty phenomenal people and people that you would never get to engage with otherwise. I mean, I remember, um, you know, I've, I've spent time with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, in his, in his trailer, just Arnold and I talking, you know, about things. I mean, how many times do you get that opportunity? Yeah. It's because yeah. there's, there's a, a film and he was interested in like the, he was interested in who I was and also interested in like the visual effects of the film or what it's going to be like, but he ended up telling me yeah. his whole life story. You know, these yeah, told many yeah. people, but just having him there tell you about being a, a <laughs> body bodybuilder and like not having any money and then, you know, uh, being a bricklayer with his, his friends and, and built and starting to, um, uh, you know, invest in apartments and how great that was. And he says, you really have to, you have to invest in an apartment. It's very good. <laughs> you, you know, all the people pay for your rent and it's great. You know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. I'm butchering his accent, but, but you know, you get to meet people like that or wh whoever yeah. it is. And, um, and every film has unique people and, and you get to, like I spent a year and a half with Bong Joon-ho. And Bong yeah. won everything this year at the Academy Awards, and and Bong. Oh, and it was I, incredible to to see to see him just sweep, just like yeah, ridiculous. And and part of it is, I mean, I saw him a number of times here in LA and in Santa Barbara uh, when he was. Well, doing well you worked. Uh, you worked on. You were the uh, VFX supervisor on uh, Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer. Yeah. Right, and that was uh, that. I just watched that last night. I was like, hey, let me check it out for do the interview fantastic film really yeah. uh really interesting to see and I, I can definitely see some continuity uh quite a bit of continuity in terms of bonho style from uh that too although they're vastly different movies parasite and uh well and it's it's uh, as he says it's a, a horizontal social structure on the train and it's a vertical social structure in parasite and and that was what he was exploring and he's just brilliant filmmaker and just a wonderful mm. guy and great so fun and um he what he did i think was pretty amazing the last he spent like about four months uh basically being in los angeles and all over the world and meeting all the people in the academy and all these different places that vote for awards and things like that um and he just charmed them to death because he's just a charming person and all very respectful of film he's deep knowledge of film and film history and very grateful to be in the field and loves loves it loves his actors love the people that he works with and he's just fantastic to work with uh, and a story i tell about bong is like when i first went to prague to work on snowpiercer um you go into i went uh into the office and then uh, one of the assistants came in and says, uh, Director Bong would like to see you at two o'clock. And, and basically on the set, everything is formal. So he's Director Bong. Uh, when you go out after, after work and when you're going out and having beers, it's like he's Bong, you know. It's yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I like that formality. There's something about that that uh -huh. really works. Because everyone, there's no like um strata of anything it's like everyone's there to do a job and and so i'm 100%. supervisor i'm supervisor durst he's director bong your producer so and so so and so so all, all that kind of stuff so um so I went everyone in plays their part in the orchestra to make the yeah. to make the symphony happen to make the music yeah and so um so i remember going into his office and he says eric i want to show you the film and he showed me, I think it was five or maybe it was seven images on his desk. Okay. And he says, this is the film. He says, this is, this is basically 
captures everything. So if you know these images, you get everything. So this is the this is the train. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like inside. This is so and so and so. And it basically captured it um, distilled down everything in the film. And do you have any questions? And I would ask him a few things. And one thing great about Bong is that he knows the film so well. He has like spent years on it and he's thought of every angle and every different option and so if you go to him and ask him well why are we doing the camera this way why don't we have the camera over here he will answer it and he'll answer it with great respect and not say you're a you're a dumbass you know you just stay in your place <laughs> and i'm i'm the director i'm god yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do it this way yeah. none yeah. of that pure yeah. openness pure like respect for everybody and he will yeah. answer the question and you realize wow. the reason he has his camera there makes total sense because he's already considered what you've thought about yeah so he's yeah. thought of every angle every so there's nothing to hide you can ask him anything you want because he's thought about every possibility so every so you are late to the game because he's already <laughs> thought it so he will tell you so yeah um, yeah so I was impressed by all these images, and, and so uh, we talked for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then went back. And then I remember going, we had a, a server at that point, and you could connect to the art department and all the, the artwork and everything. So I remember going into the artwork folder of, of what was the, um, uh, the artwork for the film, and looking through all the images, I realized there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images. And all the images that he, those seven images that he showed me had been distilled down by all those different images. So it was like having um, a vineyard, you know, and you have all these different grapes and everything. And anyway, they, they coalesced all these grapes into like, <laughs> you know, the finest wine possible. I mean, he had, yeah, he had been able yeah. to do that and it takes time, but he's that kind of guy, kind of director. So when he shoots, he shoots no coverage. He just shoots what he knows there needs to be because he's already uh -huh. put it together in his mind. And I've worked with other directors who wanted to do that, who said, I don't need any coverage, but in the editing room, you find out you really So when do. you say coverage, you're, you're referring to kind of like uh, additional angles to stitch the scene together. Right. Kind right. of just so, in case so, shots. Just in case shots, right. So you have yeah. like a wide shot, you have a, a yeah. two shot, you have maybe a close up and you have here and then maybe you have a third camera that's just catching stuff, you know. So, so you're, you're saying editing, Bonho, there was none of that. He said, this nothing. is the angle I want. This is the angle we're getting. There was the one shot. That was it. Shot very little film. Shot maybe 3,000. We shot in film, so we shot about 3,000 feet a day, which is not wow. 2,500 yeah. feet a day. And so when you edited it, it was yeah. there. And then... Um, uh, Jim Mo, who was the uh, actually was nominated for Academy Award for being the best editor on Parasite, was also on Snowpiercer, and so uh, Jim Mo was like the on-set editor. So as as he was mm -hmm. shooting, Bong would put these things together, making sure he had everything that he wanted. So we yeah, actually yeah. end of the day, so it was the film was edited. The film by the time production was done, post production in terms of editing was also already done. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, there's more or less first draft. I mean, more more or less first draft, yeah. And and um, that's so and, interesting. And then we ended up working. Uh, I'm I'm listening. I'm just gonna replace the replace the battery here, so you can. No worries. So, um, Bong Bong was in uh, after production of that film. Bong was in uh, Seoul, Korea, and I was here in L.A. And we would do um, we would do. Uh, you know, Skype calls at that point, and uh, we would connect. And one thing interesting about Bong was that 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 movie, which really part of the Korean um, deal, is that they're a relatively small country. I mean, by you know, they're, they're thirty to forty million people, I guess, in Korea, and they have a deep culture, very loyal um, film goers. And so they um, wanted to get outside their zone. They only, they knew they could only, if they only catered to the Korean audience, then they would only have 
30 or 40 million people at most. And so mm -hmm. they wanted to do cultural things outside of that. And so what they did is gotcha. um, they wanted to have films that went outside the barrier. So this was one of those, which was all in English. It was a Hollywood film without Hollywood. So it was uh, Korean <laughs> okay, and worldwide gotcha. investors. Um, and then yeah. once, once, you know, Chris Evans got involved and Tilda Swinton and, and mm -hmm. John Hurt and all these, these great actors, um, got involved, then it started to steamroll and people just wanted to work with Bond because they'd heard about him. And, uh, -huh. uh at that point it was a little under the radar, but, um, that was sort of a, an introduction into a wider market. And a number of Korean directors have tried to do that. And Bong is sort of the one who's really broken through in a huge way. And um, because he's just a masterful filmmaker, he really thinks about it. And he's just a wonderful person. I mean, he's just really excited and, and uh, just a great, great, uh, fun person to be around. So everyone resonates with that. And so that's why he's been so successful. So I've really enjoyed working with him. Yeah, no, it sounds like, it, and to me, whenever I, I, I hear, you know, I've seen a few different filmmakers who operate like that in terms of uh, just, just people that I follow where they see the film and even people that I, I work with uh, now, I, I think when you can see the final product finished in your head mm -hmm. before it's ever done, that's when you know you're building to something uh, right. that has, a, where, where there's a clear vision and real thought behind what you're doing. Right. And that to me is, is always the mark of a, of a master or someone who's building to right. become a master. And you need that because you have, you're driving, um, it's like a stampede, you know, you've got like hundreds of people behind you and you say, we're gonna go that way. And then the, the whole train goes that way and then everyone goes that way. And if you can't, if you say, oh no, I think we're gonna go that way. It's like, oh, we have to go that way. Now we're going this way. It's like, you know, you have, to have a very <laughs> strong direction because you 100%. have so many people behind you yeah, yeah. Um, that works. And um, yeah. I know another supervisor was talking about when you're on set, I, I believe this is really, I've, I've thought about this a lot, where sometimes you have to make a decision like right on the spot. Like mm -hmm. we want a, a, a blue screen here, do we want a blue green screen, or do we want it to be up here, we want it to be there, what's the lighting, what, whatever it is. I mean, there's some decision you have to make on the spot because it costs so much money every minute that you're on there so you make a decision and then as it progresses you realize sometimes oh maybe we should have done it the other way oftentimes it's best just to stay on stick that with it. stick with it yeah. and then clean it up later or just sort of you know figure it out because the cost of changing and the whole crew changing is more expensive just in money costs, but also in um, cost of them believing you. So if, you, if you're the person that changes their mind all the time, they'll stop believing you. So yeah, yeah. it's sort of like on the set, I try to make my demands um, not too many. Concise. And, and precise and also when absolutely needed. So when, if I'm saying, you know, guys, we have to stop for an hour and build a blue screen here, or we have to take this blue screen down and do something. And when I say it, they know it's important and they don't question it. And you have to build that respect on the stage. If you don't have it, you uh, get into a lot of problems. So you have to- How do you that. stay zen? I definitely want to come back and, and learn a little bit more about what it was like uh, shooting with Bonho, but when you're uh, on set mm -hmm. and your goal is to be able to convey uh, your thoughts and what you know is necessary for the post-production process and for VFX, uh, but you're considering, like there's maybe four different ways you could light or set up this one scene. How do you stay zen in the face of uh, knowing that it's exactly what you said, right? Knowing that if you make this judgment call and you realize 20 minutes into shooting it, oh, I probably should have done it that way based on how it's panning out. Um, that has a lot of ramifications. So keeping all that in mind, what, how do you keep yourself centered and confident in those moments? I think a lot of it is just um, having done it so much 
And yeah. uh, I remember the first time, first big movie I did, which was uh, that I was the peer supervisor on, um, and it was this Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. And so <clears throat> I remember asking about, we had a whole set that we had to, to put green screen or blue screen in. And so I remember the, you know, the grips would say, how, how big is it? What were the dimensions? And I remember sort of like saying, oh, it should be this high and it'd be this big and so forth. And uh, didn't think much about it. And then uh, went to the set like a few days later and saw the result of that. So I would see like 20 people working on what I set up. They were responding to the exact measurements that I asked for. And it just scared the hell out of me because it was like, oh my God, this is like, this isn't just sort of like, oh, maybe we should do this or maybe do that. And it's very casual. It has ramifications and you see the result of that. And it was just scared the hell out of you. And um, then you get more used to it. I mean, you get, you, you know, you're going to be scared when those things happen because you know, it impacts so many people and there's no going back. So if you really fucked up, you really fucked up and it's, it's you know, you're going to, everyone's going to see it and know about it. So you have to, to balance, you have to mitigate that experience through just knowledge. And once you do it a number of times, you just sort of get it down and then you can answer those questions pretty easily, almost just intuitively. And once you, that's a good point to be in place to be in because then you don't have to be as scared or, or is, is weird. So then you can be very relaxed. Uh, but there are periods like in anything, if you learn anything, you, you don't know what it is. So, and that, and you have to be scared. You have to do, you know, people say you have to do one thing that you're scared of every day. You know, you have to do that to, to keep attuned to that. So you don't want to get so, um, comfortable. Uh, comfortable that you sort of lose your edge so you have to be able to you know do new things all the time but the things that yeah other people think are extraordinarily difficult to you it's just easy you've done it a thousand times and um so there's a certain ease and pe people pick that up also if you act nervous or you are nervous they're nervous so if you do something and they say really i don't i don't think so and it's like if you're totally confident then they say well i you seem to be okay with it and you've done a lot so i guess it's okay and then it is okay and they learn yeah, you, the you kind of got to set the tone you set the of, tone of the day right yeah. and there's a lot of that that goes on in a film set because it's so it, you're spending sometimes two hundred thousand dollars a day yeah. So if you're shooting a 10 hour day, it's $20,000 an hour and you can divide it up into minutes and it, it gets very expensive. So a half hour is $10,000. And so you can't lose a half hour because that's 10 grand that somebody's lost. And uh, more importantly than that, that is time that you necessarily can't make up. So you don't get the extra shot or you don't get whatever it is. So it's, it's not necessarily much about as much about money as about the resources that you have in every day and how you maximize those. So you get the most on in camera. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Cause it's like, uh, my money is definitely a limited resource, uh, but more so than that is time, right? You, there's no, right. there's no, uh, there's no getting that back. Um, right. And just to take take a couple of steps back, what what was it like working working uh, with uh, with Bon on on Parasite in terms of oh, like, no, you, yeah it was it's it's on Snowpiercer yeah my yeah. bad because uh, well it, it's you know it's it's wonderful to hear that uh, that it, it's it wasn't like ah oh, I'm a director I am God this is what I want this is this is what this is what this is how it must be this is how I see it it's very much a democracy. It's very much like if you, if there is, if you know a better way to do this, let me know that convert, that is an open conversation. But in your experience, he had, he had genuinely thought it out. So it wasn't really a matter of, uh, like he was open to it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a pride. It wasn't a thing that he needed to be prideful of. Well, uh, it, it wasn't a democracy. I think, like what I, what I've, 
It okay. wasn't democracy. So it wasn't like people voted on it. It's like, right. and he's talked about <laughs> this. It's like, um, there's a, um, actually there's a YouTube that where he's in Santa Barbara and he introduces me in the audience and we talk about this a little bit. Um, but he talks about how he is always in control. Yeah. But he's in control because he just knows more than everybody. I mean, he, he's in control in, in the truest way. He's in control because he has thought it through and he knows what he's gotcha. doing. And so everybody supports yeah. that. If there are any questions, he'll answer it, but he, he's going to do what he's going to do because he's already figured out the path and he will, uh, introduce you to those ideas. And, and if you have any questions, he'll explain them why he's doing it. Um, and it makes total sense. And so when you, when you realize that there's a complete trust in that and everyone gets on board and no one has to worry about it because I've been on films where obviously people don't know what they're doing and you don't have a third act and, and no one knows and they're just sort of shooting from the hip and and that's when everyone gets really nervous because mm -hmm. you don't know if you're going to be there for, uh, you know, eight hours or uh, 50 hours. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. No one does. And yeah. so it makes yeah. people really nervous. And so the thing about Bong is um, he just has such a handle on it. He can be open. Yeah. He can be open. Yeah. And that's something that uh, I've been really fascinated with because I've worked with directors who are the opposite, where I'm the director, you're nothing, you just do what I say because I'm God. Yeah. And usually when people say that, they're the direct opposite. And so they, are, they don't know what they're doing and they're very insecure. And certain political leaders have the same <laughs> tendency. And so, um, but, uh, so I'm interested and fascinated by people who have, who great, have great leadership through without trying or seemingly mm. without trying. They, mm. they know their stuff so much, they get instant respect and there, there's a huge openness about everything. Yeah. I have that same experience with Ron Howard. I did a, uh, a film, uh, a series called Genius and with about Albert Einstein and Ron Howard was the uh, producer and also directed, directed the pilot that I did with Ron and, and he did the same thing. And so I asked, I remember one night we were having dinner and I, I was asking Ron about this very fact. It's like, uh, I said, you know, um, it, it's interesting that you command so much on the set, command so much respect and are obviously in charge of the set, it's your set, there's no question about it, um, but you're so open and you empower people. How do you do that? And he said, um, well, I really understand story. I know how to tell a story. And mm. I know that I don't know every, and there are a thousand ways to tell a story. And I don't know everything, all the thousand ways. So I'm always interested in what people have to say. and I, if you're really passionate about something, let me hear it because maybe that's a better way to do it. And so I remember pitching him, I was doing the thought experiments for Einstein. And so I remember I had a pitch with Ron and, and uh, sort of showed in different ways of doing it. And he really liked it a lot. And it was just very welcoming. You're talking about different ways of, ex of uh, representing it visually through the VFX. Yes, right. V gotcha. Visual ways. Oh, we could gotcha. do this. We could do this. And here, here are some visual examples and so forth. He really yeah. dug it. And then, so he uh, shot the film and I realized he had taken um, a good portion of those. He'd taken some of those ideas and used them, but he also incorporated, incorporated them in, in different ways as well. And so he, he said, because I know how to tell a story, um, that's my job. And so you, I, I'm really interested in your ideas and I will take some and say, yes, that works or that doesn't work in telling the story, but I'm the manager of the story, but not manager of all the ideas. Mm. And so that creates this, this real welcoming and, and very much a, um, an openness to the set and everyone feels very relaxed about it because they know Ron is really good at telling story. He knows how to do it. He's got it under control. 
he may not know every detail of everything, but he um, will always be able to make the right decision. And uh -huh. so there, there's uh -huh. an openness to that kind of leadership. And what it sounds like to me is that it comes down to having that trust that the people who are making the calls are making the calls from a place of knowledge, understanding, uh, knowledge and understanding, and not from a place of uh, ego. So from a place right. of like, like I am the director, so I get to make this call. No, no, it's not from a place of uh, right. authority in terms of like structure. It's from a place of, I know where my strongest skill sets are. And right. based on my understanding of his strong skill set, he knew was his understanding of the story. Right. So because he trusted in that skill set, he was able to maintain that open environment where it, it wasn't about getting, it, didn't, it wasn't a challenge when someone proposed an idea to him. It was an opportunity to tell the story in a better way. Right. Or t tell a way. It's like, I remember um, uh, also what Ron would do, and I, I saw him do this a couple of times. When somebody would pitch him an idea, he would say, well, that's not really how I saw it. You know, I didn't really see it that way. But I would like you to tell me how you think it fits in the story. Hmm. And then you would, you would say that and he would say, oh, that makes sense or that doesn't make sense because of so forth. But yeah. he would never say, he would never yeah. say that no. is a shitty idea. That's yeah, horrible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Never say that. He would always turn it around, frame it a different way and say, That's I didn't think of it this way, but why yeah. don't you tell me from my point of view, how I would fit that into the story. Uh -huh. And so... I thought that was really interesting and a really brilliant way of deflecting or like, it's almost like Tai Chi. I mean, Tai Chi is where you take somebody's energy and you redirect it to the other way. He was sort of doing a Tai Chi thing with an idea. And to me, I, I think that's fascinating. I mean, be able to work with Bong or, or, or uh, Ron Howard or those kind of people. It's just, you really work, you get to work with some really high level people on a very intimate scale and there yeah. are very few jobs that you can do that. And so that's what keeps me going because that helps you develop. And, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the, the fun part. So that's what keeps my energy going. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's so, um, everything is so inter, fantastically interwoven mm -hmm. uh, from the relationships that you build as you move forward. Uh, and I was going to say in your career, but it doesn't, it's not in your career, it's in your life, right? Like right. the relationships right. that you build with the people that you resonate with, the, the, the way that you then bring that energy onto set and into what you create. And uh, then your ability to stay open and learn from people who are just cl very clearly doing things, executing at a very high level. Right. Uh, fantastic fantastic and I, I guess like that this leads me to my last couple of questions i know i know we've been going for a while here and yeah, i, no, I really fine. appreciate that yeah. um what so right now as i level up um i'm in, in a very similar stage to draw parallels between uh your story uh kind of post university i've taken a year off university and mm -hmm. i'm trying to see whether i can just do this myself and uh Every, with, with each project that I do, and obviously uh, with the projects that I, I'm a part of and I'm learning from when I'm a PA on set or when I'm an AD on set and learning uh, in other ways, or even on my own projects when I am directing, mm -hmm. I'm trying to level up the quality of what I'm making with each project. Uh, and the goal is to get to features, right? Uh, right. That's, 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 really, that's, really, that's really my goal, to be able to tell movies to be able, sorry, to be able to tell stories at the scale of movies, to be able to have that impact on, on how people think and their perspective on the world. Uh, but then also second part to that question is, uh, I'm sure you've had experience with that as you were coming up in the commercial world, but now at your current stage in your career, how are you continuing to kind of like level up? And cause there's always that next level in terms of right. level and uh, of, at which you can execute uh because anyone who's pushing the boundaries of their craft always sees you know you finish it and you're like ah okay 
I could have made it better in this way. I could have made it better in that way. Uh, so yeah, those, those are kind of the two parts of the question. One, as you're coming up and moving up to the, that level of feature film quality, uh, right. how do you, how do you, how did you make those kind of progressions and jumps in quality? And now uh, that you're there and you're executing at that level, how do you continue to do that while delivering uh, at a very high stakes level? Right. Well, I think um, like how to get there is um, a, a lot of it, at least in my journey, you know, has been just being able to um, get on projects with other people. You can't do it by yourself or I couldn't do it by myself. Yeah, so I 100%. had to, to be around other people who gave me opportunities to enable me to be in these venues where, where that was expected. And when it's expected, you have to go up to it because uh, I, given my own, just, you know, doing it by myself, I would not, the quality wouldn't be there. So mm -hmm. um, I need other those, people to hold you to those standards. Yeah, I need, yeah. And also just, well, not necessarily people doing it, but like everyone is, you see everyone working at such a high level. You, mm -hmm. you have to as well, because you, step you don't want to, you know, yeah, you step it up. You don't want, want to be the, uh, the slow one, you know, you want to be the one who is, um, is working with them. So, um, and it's such a team effort that you see the result. Like if you don't cover something, you don't do something, you see the impact. You see like where someone else has to cover for you or someone else has to does, do something, it, it ripples. So you, you, it's a group, uh, what do you call it? Where it's like- um, It's a team sport. Uh, gr group influence kind of thing. Yeah, a team sport thing. So um, I work well in those kind of environments. I work better in those kind of environments than independently, it, probably, it. even though I would like to work independently that, that well, I, I think I work better in a team sport. And so, I mean, I, I think part of, it is, part of the advice is, is to surround yourself with the best people possible and try to get involved in the best project you can in whatever position it is. I mean, when I came out of, film school is like, I'm a director, you know, I can do everything. And then, and if you're offered a job as a PA doing coffee, it's like, I don't do that. I'm a director. That's a very bad attitude. You should 100%. not do that yeah, because it's yeah. about meeting people. And, yeah. um, um, it, it's like, um, uh, like this is a podcast speaking of podcasts. I mean, Tim Ferriss, you know, who does a great podcast. One of my favorite, favorite Absolutely. podcasts. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you listen to uh, some of his, his talking about like why he does a podcast, mm -hmm. he comes at a, uh, he comes at a, a, a framing of a question. So it, uh, he always wins. So it's not like he doesn't have a podcast to make a million dollars, even though he makes multi-million dollars doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he comes at it for two reasons. Uh -huh. And one is to, uh, connect with other people to have uh, re relationships and build a network of, of, of acquaintances like and friends and, and yeah. people that you know and building your network and also learning to uh, ask better questions. That's mm -hmm. it. And then, so he wins every time, whether one person sees it or a million people see it. He wins. Yeah. He's, he's coming yeah. from that point of view. So I try to do that in film as well. It's like I try to learn something every day and I try to put myself in a position where I can sort of um, basically have the energy. I, I work a lot on energy management, like getting proper sleep and all that kind of stuff. Which is yeah, I noticed hard. you had the, the aura ring on there. I have the aura ring, yeah, there you <laughs> go, and, which is amazing. And um, uh, doing that because they all connect together. So to me, it's fascinating just as a human development skills, you know, trying to yeah, come, whether yeah. the film succeeds or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I've had, I mean, it does matter, but it's like, I'm not wedged to that. I've had great experiences on film to totally tank. Um, <laughs> but the, the relationship of the people, and I just sort of like that system working into it, and it's a challenge every day. So uh, to me, the work is an offshoot of that. The result is, is an offshoot of that. It's almost like podcasting. Mm. You make a million dollars. That's great. But yeah, yeah. if you just do the work and just keep it to simple things that you can manage, 
then that you will get there. So I try yeah. to yeah. do that every day. Yeah, I and, like I, I like that I like that mindset and that that uh, it, it it very much is just a matter of sticking to uh, your values, right? That's that's mm-hmm. what it seems like, right? Yeah. And in film, like if there's something you really want to do and a style you want to pursue, pr- pursue um, as you know, you can do it. I mean, you just have so many abilities right now, not only broadcasting it as we're doing it right now, or, uh, you know, to making it, I mean, incredible uh, cameras that you can get for inexpensively. I mean, you can make a movie with your phone. I mean, you can do it very simply. So there's a lot of ways to tell a story. And, yeah. um, and everyone's doing that. And so if you tell a story and it's engaging, and if you're, you sort of market it in interesting ways, you can get attention. Um, and, but ultimately, like if you're, if, if you want to be in Hollywood and like a Hollywood quote, you know, level position and in, in the, the highest field, um, there's a point where you have to break through. I mean, you have to get involved in those larger projects. And there are, you know, the exemption, exemptions to that, of course. I mean, there are people who have made uh, films on YouTube and that gets noticed and then that gets you a contract or it gets you to, like, um, I was talking to Robert R- Rodriguez uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. And Robert, you know, is, is well known for um, doing amazing stuff. I mean, El Maharachi, he made for $5,000 and it sold at Sundance and started his career. And he's very much hands-on kind of guy. And um, so he is one of the people, I think, as a, as, a, as a hero, you know, that it was able to take very humble means and make a career out of it because he's just a great storyteller. And yeah, so if yeah. you're a great storyteller, it will come out and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. do whatever you can to to do that or or if you're a stylistic filmmaker or something like that there are ways to build your chops but also i think it's important to sort of on a political level uh just sort of the the way it works level you know get hooked up with higher projects if you can because you'll meet people that will will help your work go further so if you're doing great work and you happen to be on a film and there's a great director and somehow and you and and the chemistry is right and whatever and say hey i got this film and say oh oh, look at that that's ethan's film it's it's awesome it's great and you know that's a step and that takes you one step further so you've got to manage the opportunities with the work that you're doing i mean those are Mm. two separate things that have to merge somehow you know, those two kind of variables, as you put it, that does really seem uh, what, what it seems to be coming down to because there are the opportunities for external projects that, that I'm seeing in front of me. Mm-hmm. And then there are the like, internal projects uh, that I want to create that right. uh, kind of shows the world like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess it's just finding a balance of building those relationships and putting your own work out there. And also there's, I've seen this happen before where people do it too early. So they go to somebody and say, hey, I got a film. You wanna look at the film? And you're trying to sell it. And, and yeah, the immediate yeah. thing is no, go away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you build a relationship and it's more casual uh-huh. and they know you on an entirely different level, you cannot ever be a salesperson, you can't be you got to yeah, be who yeah. you are. It's got to yeah. be a general connection and a, a genuine uh, relationship. And then somebody can see your, see your work and they know you. And then that mm-hmm. can work. But it has to be very organic. And yeah. it can't be, you can't be selling stuff to people. And it gets frustrating for some folks because that often takes time. Sometimes it doesn't take time. But I've seen it so many times where people try to force it. And it's frustrating because sometimes it may take a long time and sometimes it may not. It's just a matter of getting the right opportunity, but also the person you're going to show work to, you've got to have a connection first. Once you have a connection, then they're interested in you and your, what your work is. The work doesn't 
supersede you. So you have to <laughs> Sounds great. That. So I'll send over some of my work right after this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now they know each other. I like to see it, actually. I've never seen it. So you, I, now we know each other. But yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's true. And honestly, it's like, that's, that's why I was really, really excited to sit down and have this conversation with you. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes before a podcast, I'm a little bit nervous or this or that. Um, but, you know, I really wasn't nervous to sit down and chat with you because uh, when we did, like, so just for the listeners, I'll kind of... Uh, share how we met Uh, I was just sitting at a coffee shop grabbing some tea before I was going to meet a client of mine who I was who I'm trying to we're trying to put a a pilot together for a show Mm -hmm. and so I'm just there drinking some tea and I see you uh, sitting at the table right beside me and you have kind of like a script on your iPad you're jotting some notes down on there and you seem to be putting a shot list together on your laptop Mm -hmm. so I just go hey uh, what is that? A, is that a shot list you're working on? Like, what's, I'm yeah. just curious, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you're like, yeah, it's for the show. I can't really tell you about it, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's pretty cool. This is what I'm working on. And we just get to chatting and uh, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I had a, I had a good, I had a good chat. I had a good chat. Mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. it was, it was just very interesting to, to me, it was just like so much, just like genuine curiosity as to like, wow, this is what it's like to be, uh, working at this level and I think just in terms of I think there was that recognition in terms of uh, I'm also uh, very interested in personal growth and self-realization mm-hmm. and, and things right. like that and we didn't discuss that but I think there was that kind of like uh, mutual recognition that uh, right. we were both thinking in terms of uh, not the work but the relationship you know right right yeah yeah, that, that's important. I mean, because we, and we've talked about this it's a theme throughout, the relationships yeah. are the glue that, that ties together everything that you do. So, and, and relationships are energy, really. So it's like knowing how to work in those environments and with people who are very amicable and then people who are total assholes. I mean, you have <laughs> to know they're all around and it's like you have to know how to work in all those environments and uh, to me, that's the fascinating part about it. It's just the human dynamics of it is more fascinating than even the movie. It's, it's just really interesting how those things come about. And, um, and that, in a way, is that's what gets people's interest. And, um, but, uh, yeah, no, it, we had a great conversation at the coffee shop and, uh, and uh, led to this. So I'm, I'm really glad to have been on your podcast. It's been fun. Yeah, so that was a long one. And uh, I think it was well worth it. Thank you, Eric, for just dropping gems on gems on gems. It was a great chat, and uh, I learned a lot. And it was it's just fantastic to hear what someone else's story has been, especially someone so established. Because I think we're all, we're all on our own journeys, and all of our stories are going to be different. But there is... Uh, overarching narratives that you can pull from the people who have walked this path before you uh, so you can get a sense of what it's going to take to get where you want to go to build the lifestyle the career that you want to build and yeah that's it for this week thank you for tuning in and we'll be back we'll be back in a couple weeks with some more fire (laughs) not sure who the guest is going to be but you know it'll be someone great so i'll see you then